long before we met. I admired him from a distance. And then we met when I was teaching here at Rutgers. We met before then, but we really met. We really got to know one another. When I was here, um, I was teaching at the two Rutgers Law Schools some years after I retired, and I spent the uh, fall semester in Rutgers Newark, and I spent the spring semester uh, in Rutgers Camden. They were separate then. Um, and I got to know Paul, and it's one of the delights of my retirement years that we got to know one another. Um, the first thing I want to say is that he was, how, he was kind to me in a way that very few people are kind to others. I think he may not remember it this way, but I think he went out of his way to make sure that I felt comfortable here, that I was welcome. We met so many times in his office and talked about the law, about what he was doing, uh, about what I was teaching. Um, we shared so many interests. And then he told me about this book that he was putting together, Courting Justice, New, 10 New Jersey cases that shook the nation. And he told me the cases and the people that were writing the different chapters on the cases. And I thought to myself, I don't know if I would have chosen those same cases, but I certainly would have chosen many of them. Um, this is a fascinating project about the court. And Paul asked me if um, I would write a little piece, a foreword um, to the book. And so we had occasion to meet more often about the other chapters and the forward and what um, he was doing. It gave me a different view of the Supreme Court that I had sat on for 10 years and what he's given to others, what he instinctively has felt that he owes to other people around him and how he has tried to improve the lives of others through the education work he's done, but broadly. And that's extraordinary and special. And I thank you, Paul. Back when I was at a crossroads in my career in 2001, I was mentioning to Ilan that uh, I didn't know where to go. And he said, you should talk to Paul Trachtenberg. And I talked to Paul. I called Paul, and Paul said, we should talk. And I suspect that a lot of you in the room have had similar conversations like that or experiences where Paul said, we should talk. Doris Kearns Goodwin defines a significantly influential or historic person. They must be originals, people who have laid a foundation for enduring institutions or cultural practices or ways of thinking. Yet another says they must have made a difference that has long-term and fundamental differences. And finally, Time Magazine says, these are people where the, the places they have worked or been have left statistical evidence of their presence behind. So Paul, I think, having looked at those definitions of significantly influential people and historic figures, you clearly are among those in the United States of America, significantly influential person and a historic figure. He was here uh, 28 years before I even arrived. Uh, now, I came here to uh, Rutgers Newark as Dean of Arts and Sciences. And the Dean of Arts and Sciences typically doesn't have a whole lot of interaction with faculty in other schools. Uh, I mean, you should, but you know, you got 19 departments and all kinds of other things to, to deal with. But my examples, uh, if there were two or three, one of them was always Paul Trachtenberg, because it was such a great example of the impact that um, a university and professors and research could have on the life of the city. In 1973, uh, I was at the Ford Foundation and responsible for the Ford Foundation's program in public interest law. And it was my responsibility to decide whether or not we should recommend a grant to Paul Trachtenberg and the creation of the Education Law Center. Uh, you guys know the history past that and my affirmative recommendation. So I thought it would be interesting for you, Paul, and for some of our colleagues here, 
to hear some excerpts from the document that my colleague Jim Kelly, who you know from the Education Division of Ford, and I wrote to McGeorge Bundy, who was then the president of the Ford Foundation, seeking his approval of a grant to the Education <coughs> Law Center. And I do it because I re retrieved the, this document from the, from the Ford archives, and I thought you would get a particular kick out of hearing what our expectations were of you, and also what we thought of you, and why we thought we ought to give you a grant, okay? Uh, the first paragraph is the key one. A grant of $450,000 for two years is recommended for general support of the Education Law Center to be established in Newark, New Jersey, and to focus on the application of law to public educational issues in the Middle Atlantic region with primary emphasis on the states of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And Paul, I'm gonna give you this document, okay? You can give it to your grandkids. Thanks. Okay. Like with everything else he does, he pursued funding with dogged determination. And it does not surprise me that he has continued his important work during his retirement. I would have not expected less, although I suspect Naima would have liked him to retire a little bit more. Uh, but that's not in Paul's DNA, and the world is better for it. I first had the opportunity to learn about Paul Trachtenberg when I was a young lobbyist. Um, and Paul Trachtenberg at that time was sort of a mythical figure to me. I wasn't yet an attorney. I decided to go to law school in the evenings and came to Rutgers. When I graduated from law school, I had a, a very clear goal in mind to figure out a way to keep working with Paul Trachtenberg. And together we worked to create what was called the Rutgers FEA Education Law and Policy Institute and had the wonderful uh, opportunity to educate school leaders across the state of New Jersey regarding really essential fundamental school law and policy issues. You know, and I think I've learned um, over the years and, and the chance to work with Paul that there are some lessons that have really come to the fore. You know, whether you are biking, whether you are fighting for a cause, whether you are teaching, it's important to have a clear vision. Know what you're actually trying to achieve. Know where you're trying to go. Um, know what race you're in. And what struck me as really incredible was that Paul had been in a 50-year fight and didn't seem tired at all <laughs> and had the same energy and passion that I'm sure he had on, on day one of that fight. We do what we have to do. We do about 18% pro bono work. I will never let a parent leave my office who has a credible case if, I am the, if the reason they don't have legal representation is because of the money they do or do not have in their bank. And so we have a policy that if they have a credible case, we will take them on as a client. And we have been doing that, and I have been doing that now for over 40 years. So I, Paul, I owe you a great deal of thanks. Because I don't know where I would be 40, 50 years later if it wasn't for you. Because when I did my first year here, I, I found a lot of the professors to be indifferent, somewhat egotistical. They were a professor in a law school and they thought that uh, they were special. You were special, but you never acted that way. You were humane, you were reasonable, and you became my friend. And for that I consider to have been privileged, and I thank you. I immediately connected with Paul because out of that outrage, that anger that was fueling me, um, that had just built up through uh, certainly my experiences in the South Bronx, knowing that justice in New York City ended at 97th Street. And then I met someone who was dealing with these issues and was dealing with these issues. These are his children. There's no question about it. And as we talked among the minority students in the school at that time, Paul was special. He was one of us. 
Uh, I know Paul both as a lawyer for the years I was a judge, and then after I left the court, we were colleagues at Rutgers Law School. Uh, I've taught here as an adjunct for 2006. We weren't equal colleagues. He was a professor emeritus, and I was an <laughs> adjunct. Uh, but I guess during those years, we've had the opportunity to exchange thoughts and views about a variety of subjects. His office was always open to me, and he would talk to me about his research and issues on his mind, and I would do the same. We followed closely the developments during the Christie administration's effort to shut down public education and would share views. And that was a very special opportunity for me, and I value it. Uh, but I know him primarily as an advocate, which is what I'll talk about. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge that we both share a passion for bicycle riding. And so we've talked about our bicycle experiences often. My longest bike ride was a 65-mile bike ride on my 65th birthday. And so the other day, when I asked Paul what his longest bike ride was, <laughs> I was a little taken aback when he told me that he had done the Central Jersey Bike Club longest day ride from High Point to Cape May, which is over 200 miles, about a half a dozen times. <laughs> so uh, I thought about it after we hung up. And now I understand where he got the endurance from to <laughs> litigate Robinson v. Cahill and Abbott. <laughs> because Paul was in Robinson v. Cahill from the get-go. He represented the NAACP and the ACLU. Harold Ruvalt wouldn't let him come in as an amicus. And so he was in the case from the start. He argued Robinson won before the New Jersey Supreme Court, and the court unanimously held that uh, the thorough and efficient clause of the state constitution guaranteed urban school kids uh, equal funding. And so many of those kids got a better chance at an education because of the work that he did. His conviction, when he came to Rutgers Law School, he told me, was that the law should be used for the public good. Uh, Paul was a New Jersey hero, and Rutgers Law School should be very grateful that they offered him a job in 1970. If I were really prudent and attentive to your needs, uh, my remarks would consist of about three words, or maybe five, like thank you and let's eat. Um, but since I want to do something a little different than the program has dealt with, uh, I, I will ask you to indulge me. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, that you have shared this occasion with me uh, is remarkable that you all represent such an extraordinary cross-section of my life and my professional efforts is a, a great source of gratification. Um, I don't want this to sound like an Oscar acceptance speech, <laughs> but uh, I do have to extend some special thanks. Uh, Rob Steinbaum really had the inspiration and has had the follow through. Uh, over all the aspects of the program. Brenda came forward, volunteered to collaborate and to lead this section of the program, and I appreciate that. Uh, as you know, uh, Brenda and I go way back in terms of our uh, shared commitment to education and improving the quality of the public schools for children who most need it. Uh, I want to thank Mike Starrett, who's been kind of the jack of all trades behind the scenes, uh, Rob's assistant. I want to thank Larry Lussberg and the fabulous panel 
that really illuminated the two main substantive themes of my career-long engagement in education, law, and policy. Uh, I want to thank all those who shared thoughts and feelings and reminiscences uh, of the experiences we shared over the years. Uh, finally, there are close friends here and family who were able to be here, and I'm uh, greatly appreciative of that. I want to especially give a shout out to my son, Elon, who's a Rutgers Law graduate, uh, to three of um, his four spectacular children. Unfortunately, the youngest and uh, Dina, Elon's wife, are home sick with the flu and couldn't be here, but uh, I appreciate the, that the rest are. Um, and finally, I want to thank my wife, Naima, who's been the mainstay and inspiration of my life literally since the day I met her, and that's a few years ago. My biggest challenge is to try to describe almost 50 years of my Rutgers connection in a relatively few minutes, and I will try to make it a relatively few minutes. And I want to do that by focusing on four questions, and these are not substantive legal questions. And it puts me in mind of it being just like the upcoming Passover celebration, except that the Passover Seder, it's the youngest child who gets to ask the four questions. I don't think I qualify. Um, but the, the, incidentally, for those who are gluttons for punishment, a, uh, a longer version of my remarks is uh, available online through the Rutgers website. Uh, but my four questions today, unlike the questions that have been discussed, are the following. What brought me to Rutgers Law School? Two, what kept me here all these years? Three, what made possible the work which you have celebrated with me today? And four, what happens now in, quote, retirement? So quickly through the four, what brought me to Rutgers Law School? After stints at two of the highest powered New York City law firms and the Peace Corps experience and others, I concluded that at least the law firm experiences didn't provide me with what I referred to as the psychic income that I wanted and needed. Uh, I decided to explore law teaching, and the exploration was a remarkably brief one. Uh, the exploration consisted of Rutgers Law School in Newark, period. End of story. That was the only law school I considered. It's the only law school I visited. It's the only law school uh, I seriously considered. Uh, after all, for most of my life, I was a Newark and Essex County kid. I was born and raised and public school educated in Newark. And in the late 1960s, I had returned to suburban New Jersey after the Peace Corps stint in Washington. It wasn't just my Newark roots that caused me to focus on Rutgers, however. In the late 1960s, and for those of you who don't know this experience, you should read about it. Um, in the late 1960s, Rutgers was emerging as the People's Electric Law School. It was bar none the most exciting law school in the country. Uh, its commitments to a diverse student body and faculty, to clinical legal education, to serving the community, and to inculcating in all of its students, whatever their ultimate professional destinations, a fierce commitment to use law to advance the social good were absolutely extraordinary, indeed, I would say, unprecedented among law schools. Finally, there was the boundary-breaking Willard Heckel, who was the dean of the law school at the time. Uh, Willard was not only a beloved teacher and the dean who led the law school through many tempestuous times following the revolution or rebellion in Newark in the late 60s, Willard also managed to be the moderator of the Presbyterian Church of the United States, the highest elected position in the church. Uh, and he was the first head of the anti-poverty agency in Newark, the United Community Corporation. So he was an extraordinary person. To be honest, Willard and I didn't have an especially hard-nosed negotiation about my joining the faculty. I think it quickly became apparent to both of us that this was a match made in heaven. Uh, I agreed to teach half my courses and seminars, 
in areas where the law school had curricular needs, and Willard agreed that I would devote the other half of my teaching to the area that had already become my professional passion, using law to advance the educational opportunities of students who most needed such opportunities and most often did not receive them. Uh, and that's what's happened during my 46 and a half years on the law faculty. But teaching wasn't my only engagement uh, in education, law, and policy, literally, from the moment I arrived at the law school in July 1970, I became intensely involved in legal advocacy, later action research, and almost always with my students as collaborators and partners. And I'm so delighted that a number of my former students uh, were here to speak to the connection that we formed in law school. It was a mutual connection. I think there was uh, enormous mutual respect. It was not a, a hierarchical relationship at all. Um, uh, what kept me at the law school all these years? Well, that's, that's a little bit different kind of story. I learned early on at Rutgers that what many say about law teaching is true, that at the right school there simply is no job more rewarding than being a law professor. And for me, Rutgers Law School was demonstrably the right school. It was the place I was destined to be, and it was the place I was determined to remain. Um, I was able to devote much of my time as a law professor to work that mattered deeply to me and that I believed in and, and believed was of consequence to others. There's nothing better than to earn your living doing what you value and enjoy in an atmosphere that engages you. And over the years, I was supported by many colleagues and many students who shared my beliefs and commitment and who worked shoulder to shoulder with me, both on institutional issues, and there were a lot of thorny and important institutional issues we dealt with, but on the bigger issues that involved the community outside uh, of our walls. I was also blessed, one of the great things about being a law professor, with the serendipity of exciting opportunities and to be able to accept many of them. Uh, one of the best things about being a law professor at the right school is that a faculty position is really many jobs merged into one. You can be teacher, you can be mentor, you can be researcher, you can be scholar, you can be advocate. Uh, at Rutgers, I was able to choose to engage in those activities at the school itself <laughs> or outside to use my faculty position as a kind of springboard to, to go other places and do other things. And I think the best example of that, of that is the Education Law Center. Uh, you heard from Sandy Jaffe uh, the wonderful uh, excerpts he read, which I had not uh, seen before. But you have to know, uh, I mean, $450,000 grant was a major grant. Uh, for the first five or so years of the Education Law Center, Ford was essentially the total funder of the project. And, and fundraising for me as the initial director was uh, going in to have a lovely lunch at the Ford Foundation building in New York and having a little polite back and forth about exactly how much uh, the budget would be for the next year. Um, but serendipity, why is it serendipitous? Uh, I only learned of Ford's interest in doing this funding at a dinner in New York after a professional program and somebody kind of casually said, hey, did you hear Ford is thinking about funding a public interest law project in education? Next morning, I was on the phone with Sandy Jaffe and Jim Kelly, and as they say, the rest is history. Um, now, not only did Ford provide the funding, but the law school permitted me to take a part-time leave of absence so I could direct the Education Law Center for its first three years. Um, it's a source of great pride to me uh, that almost 45 years later, the Education Law Center is flourishing under David Chiara's direction. It clearly is not only New Jersey's most important education advocate, it's become one of the nation's most important education advocates. But rich and rewarding as that experience was, it was only part of what kept me at Rutgers all these years. Uh, Alan Sadovnik talked about uh, the Institute on Education Law and Policy, as did uh, Brenda. 
Uh, and I'm proud that it was, in fact, and, and uh, he agrees, a thoroughly interdisciplinary effort. That was the goal, and I'm glad it was the reality. Um, let me go to the what made possible the work you've celebrated today, question three. I'm nearing the end. The answer to this question actually flows pretty organically from what I've already said. Um, doesn't require much additional time, which is a good thing because the big hook is about to come out. I can see Brenda starting to <laughs> chomp no, at the no. bit. No, no, no. So my answer uh, appropriately, what made the work possible has four components. There are the sponsors, supporters, and funders of the work. Uh, as I've indicated, uh, Ford has been, was in the early years, uh, the mainstay. And as I thought back on it, funding from the Ford Foundation, literally since I was a law student at the University of Michigan Law School in the early 60s, has been supportive of so much of what I've wanted to do over these many years. But they're not the only ones. Uh, there are a number of New Jersey foundations uh, led by the Fund for New Jersey, including Victoria and Prudential and Schumann, MSAJ, Amiler, and uh, Dodge, and a variety of individual donors have helped, including uh, Neil Rosenberg, uh, David Mills, one of my early students turned philanthropist, um, a succession of deans of the law school, uh, and chancellors and provosts, Steve Diner, Norman Samuels, uh, have really provided the kind of support that was essential <laughs> for my work. Uh, in terms of collaborators and colleagues and students, had I worked alone over these years, I would have accomplished little. Creative and committed collaborations have been the main engine of whatever I've been able to accomplish. And those collaborations have been diverse, they've been uh, far-flung, they've been numerous. Um, third, essential element to my success, the New Jersey Supreme Court. Um, the prominent presence here today of Debbie Poritz and, and Gary Stein, who have become good friends and professional partners, um, over the years highlights the extraordinary role that the New Jersey courts, and especially the New Jersey Supreme Court, uh, have played. Uh, were it not for the courts, really remarkable, I mean, it's unprecedented in the country that a court would make the kind of commitment and have the kind of staying power that the New Jersey Supreme Court has had. Uh, were it not for that remarkable commitment to our state school funding, and education reform litigation. My work might well have amounted to a pile of interesting articles, papers, reports, and legal briefs, probably at best a footnote in somebody's history of the last 50 years. Um, instead, with the court's commitment, we've made enormous, if incomplete, progress. Um, and Really, no one um, knows better than I, I think, how courageous the court has been. Um, uh, Debbie Poritz and Gary Stein uh, exemplify this. They remain deeply engaged substantially after their retirements from the court in the effort to improve the public schools of New Jersey long after their retirement from the court. Uh, I, I, I puzzle periodically about the fact they're both Republicans. How can that be? <laughs> um, finally, how is my work possible? The Energizer Bunny. Now, you may scratch your heads over that <laughs> reference, but the reason is simple. Years ago, a group of high school students from a magnet high school program on law and justice came to spend the day at the law school. Uh, at the end of the day, there was an informal discussion between them and a few faculty members. Actually, I think it was held in this very room. Uh, and one of the students, after I had said a few things, uh, said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He asked me a great question. He said, do you have a role model? And I said, you know, I, actually, I do. But I think it's going to surprise you when I tell you who my role model is. And actually, I was thinking it surprised me who my role model is. 
wasn't Clarence Darrow, it wasn't some legal luminary. Uh, my role model was the Energizer Bunny. Uh, why? Because over my career, I'd come to realize that the most important quality one can have if achieving change is your objective is persistence. You have to establish your goal. It's a bit of, of what Dave Nash was talking about. You have to establish your goal. You have to figure out how to accomplish it. And then you just start the journey by putting one foot in front of the other. And you have to recognize that on any journey, especially a long and difficult one, uh, there will be bumps in the road, steep, seemingly endless climbs, and I say that as a bicycle rider too, as well as an Energizer Bunny fan. Uh, if you also have to realize that sometimes you'll falter and even fall. If you're determined enough, your response will be to stand up, brush yourself off, and start putting one foot in front of the other again. Um, we'd all like to have a golden tongue or unlimited <coughs> charisma. Most of us don't. Uh, but if we will it, we can all have the kind of endless persistence and staying power that the Energizer Bunny has. So that brings me to the last. What happens now in retirement? Um, since the Energizer Bunny hasn't reached its final destination yet, the journey continues. Indeed, state-level action of the kind I've emphasized throughout my career may be even more important now given current federal education directions. We need to focus on the state. We need to do uh, and accomplish what we can at the state level. To ensure that no grass grows under my personal Energizer Bunny's feet, uh, I greeted retirement last year by establishing, oh no, yet another organization, uh, a new nonprofit called the Center on <coughs> Diversity and Equality in Education. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the program for today's uh, event includes this new organization's website. You can find out uh, about my current work. I just want to shout out, because I know some of them are here, uh, an extraordinary, again, interdisciplinary research team that's working at, uh, uh, at this new center, mainly on our project on the Morris School District. Uh, so without more about that, uh, let me just say my challenge in retirement is hardly finding enough to keep the Energizer Bunny's batteries charged. Uh, rather, it's trying to find the right balance between my ongoing education, law, and policy activities and my family, friends, travel, and exercise, all of which I care about deeply. Uh, I'm working on that as we speak. Thank you for uh, sharing this wonderful program with me. Now let's adjourn to some, at long last, to some quality eating, drinking, and socializing. I've stood between you and those goodies for too long. Thank you.